Now, these ideas that I've just briefly sketched out for you are, of course, somewhat different uh, than the ideas about human origins that we get from uh, Charles Darwin and his modern followers. Um, basically, they tell us that life began on this planet uh, somewhere between two and three billion years ago. Um, then they say the first apes and monkeys came into existence about 40 million years ago. Then they say the first ape men came into existence about 6 million years ago. And finally they say that humans of our type came into existence only about 100,000 years ago. And generally they say that all of the physical evidence uh, supports you know, this uh, picture of human origins. But you know, when I did eight years of research into the entire history of archaeology, I found something quite different. You know, I found that over the past 150 years, archaeologists have discovered huge amounts of evidence showing that humans of our type have been present on this planet for this entire period of time. And the evidence takes the form of human skeletal remains, human artifacts, and human, human footprints. Now many people will ask, if there is so much evidence of this type, then why don't we hear about it so much? And uh, Sandra and Jolene referred to this process of knowledge filtration, which we see you know, illustrated here. You know, we can call the blue box the knowledge filter, and I'm sure you're very familiar with how this operates in your field. Um, it represents the fixed ideas you know, that scientists have about certain subjects, in this case, human origins. And reports of evidence that you know, conform to these fixed ideas will pass through this social filter very easily, uh, which means uh, these facts will be mentioned in textbooks. Scientists will speak about them at conferences. If you go to museums of natural history, you'll see the objects on display. But if we have reports of evidence that radically contradict these fixed ideas, then they tend to be rejected, which means we don't hear about them, we don't read about them in the textbooks, we don't see the objects in the museums. Uh, what I'd like to do now is go over some representative examples of the kinds of evidence that I'm talking about. In 1979, Mary Leakey, uh, one of the most famous archaeologists of the 20th century, discovered dozens of footprints at a place called Leitoli in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. Mary Leakey said uh, that after careful study, you know, she could see that these footprints were absolutely identical to modern human footprints. But you know, the, the footprints are found in layers of solidified volcanic ash uh, about four million years old. Now, a Vedic archaeologist wouldn't be surprised you know, to find evidence that humans of our type were walking around in Africa four million years ago. But for you know, the, the, the normal type of archaeologist of today, it would seem quite surprising. Now, Mary Leakey did not believe that humans of our type were present in Africa four million years ago. So this is how she explained uh, the presence of those footprints. Uh, she said, and most archaeologists today would agree with her, that four million years ago there must have existed some type of ape man who had feet exactly like ours, and that's how you know, the footprints were, were made. And that's certainly possible. Unfortunately, there's no physical evidence to support that idea. Now, scientists have skeletons of the ape men that existed at that time, and their, their feet are quite different you know, than modern human feet. They're very ape-like. Nobody's ever discovered uh, an ape man who, has, who had feet exactly like, like ours. Now, this topic came up for me in uh, a couple of years ago when I spoke at the World Archaeological Congress in Cape Town, South Africa. Also speaking there was this scientist, Ron Clark from England. He, he had announced the discovery of a fairly complete skeleton of Australopithecus from uh, a place called Sterkfontein in South Africa. And among the bones were the foot bones of the creature. And 
from those bones, Clark made this model of the foot, which is uh, quite ape-like, as it should be, because the bones, uh, the foot bones of the creature were quite ape-like. For one thing, the first toe is very long, and it can move out to the side, you know, like you know, a human, human thumb. Um, actually, it can move much further out to the side than you see it in this position here. The other toes are also uh, quite long, uh, sort of like short human fingers. So uh, I was, now this, this creature was about the same age as the footprints found by Mary Leakey. So after Ron Clark spoke, I was in the audience and you know, I put a question to him. And my question was, why doesn't this foot match the footprints that were found by Mary Leakey? I mean, you see what his problem uh, was. He was advertising he had uh, the oldest human ancestor, but elsewhere in Africa there was evidence that humans of our type were walking around at the exact same time. So how did he answer my question? Ron Clark said, well, it was my ape man who made those footprints found by Mary Leakey, but you know, he was walking with his long first toe pressed up tightly against the other ones, you know, like this, and he was also walking with his other long toes curled under, like this, you know, and that's how, you know, that's how the footprints were made. Now, I mean, some of you are laughing a little bit, and in Cape Town, I was also laughing a little bit. And the reason I was laughing is that the 1,000 archaeologists listening to Clark, they weren't laughing. <laughs> you know, they were just nodding their heads saying, oh, yes, that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Uh, it's another way in which this knowledge filtering process operates. Uh, uh, evidence for extreme human antiquity can be staring scientists right in the face, but they will simply make some mental adjustment to uh, conveniently explain it away. Now this is uh, an anatomically modern skull. It was part of a fairly complete anatomically modern human skeleton. It was found by you know, the Italian geologist Giuseppe Ragazzoni in the late 19th century at a place called Castanedolo in northern Italy. And he found it in layers of rock uh, roughly four million years old, you know, the same age as the footprints found by Mary Leakey. Because sometimes people will say, okay, you've got footprints, but what about a skeleton uh, of a human being uh, four million years old? Do you have that? And yes, we do have that, and this is part of the evidence. Now, what I like to do in cases like this, I mean, I mean, just as you like to you know, investigate uh, UFO reports, I like to investigate things like this. Um, you know, I went with an Italian friend of mine to northern Italy, and we went to the town of Castanedolo, and we tried to relocate uh, the site where this discovery was made. Uh, and, and going uh, through the area, we met at a house uh, near the place where we were searching, this uh, gentleman, elderly gentleman. And actually, he turned out to know, you know quite a bit uh, about the case. Uh, here I was giving him a, you know, you know, uh, showing him a copy of the Italian edition of my book, you know, The Hidden History of the Human Race. But he had in his possession some, some interesting documents. Um, <clears throat> for example, he had this old geological report about the hill at Castanedolo where this particular discovery was, uh, was made. Uh, and there's mention here of uh, Pliocene man. So Pliocene is the geological period that goes back to around four million years ago. Um, this <coughs> report contained a, a fairly detailed description of the exact place of the discovery. And uh, with the help of this gentleman and you know, this detailed description and this old document, uh, we were able to uh, relocate uh, the site where this discovery was made, and I think that's it's uh, it you know, provides an opportunity for you know, further further research uh, uh, in this same area. Now, <clears throat> many times when you know, scientists hear you know, about <clears throat> a human skeleton being found in some very ancient layer of rock, you know they say. 
Because look, it's very easy to explain. You know, there's no mystery here whatsoever. You know, what happened is very obvious. Only a few thousand years ago, someone died at this level here, and then uh, his friends dug a grave and put the skeleton down here, and you know, that's why you, know, you think you found a human skeleton and a layer of rock four million years old. Now, now things like that can happen, they do happen, but in this particular case, um, Ragazzoni, uh, the discoverer of the skeleton, was a professional geologist. He was very much aware of this problem, and in his original reports he said if it had been a burial, then all the overlying layers of rock would have been disturbed, as we see here. Uh, but he said, I checked very carefully when I was taking the skeleton out of the ground, and I could see that all the overlying layers of rock were perfectly intact and undisturbed. And that means the skeleton really is as old as the layer of rock in which it was found, in this case, uh, four million years. Now this is Carlos Ribeiro. He was the chief government geologist of Portugal in the latter part of the 19th century. And he discovered hundreds of human artifacts in his country of Portugal in layers of rock 20 million years old. Um, he displayed these artifacts in the Museum of Geology in Lisbon. And I visited that museum a couple of years ago. Um, but you won't see the objects on display today. He displayed them here in these cases, but today they're kept locked in these cabinets down here uh, where nobody can see them. Now, I did get permission from the director of the museum to study and photograph these uh, objects for a report I gave at the European Association of Archaeologists annual meeting, which was held in Lisbon a couple of years ago. And now this is a, a photograph of one of the artifacts. It's a pointed artifact made of flint and it has use marks on it. It comes from a place called Morganjera in, in Portugal. It's interesting what happened uh, with this artifact. As I said, it's, it's, it came from layers of rock 20 million years old and when Ribeiro was living, it was, uh, the objects were displayed in the museum uh, with labels indicating an age of uh, 20 million years. Now when he died, the next generation of officials in the museum left the objects on display, but they changed the labels. And this is the new label that they wrote for that particular, uh, particular object. The, uh, the first line says, instrument of flint, uh, it comes from Morgan Hera. It was discovered by Ribeiro. This line gives the age. It says Paleolithico Superior. That means the Upper Paleolithic. And you know, according to archaeologists, the Upper Paleolithic period in Europe goes back about 20,000 years. So it's interesting what they did. Uh, you know, they looked at the objects. They said 20 million years. That's impossible. Uh, 20,000 years, that sounds uh, about right. So they wrote the new labels for the artifacts, but then the next generation of officials in the museum, they put the whole collection away. Uh, and if you went to that museum today, you would, you would not see these objects. Uh, you would not even be aware you know, that they were even there. Uh, a similar case from Belgium, Th this is uh, the Belgian geologist Routot. Early in the 20th century, he discovered um, hundreds of human artifacts at a place called uh, Boncel in, in Belgium. And using his old maps and documents, I rediscovered the place where he found these. This is a, an old quarry uh, near Boncel. Uh, Belgian archaeologists told me it's, you're just wasting your time. You'll never find the place. It's probably a parking lot or a supermarket by now. But you know, I did rediscover the place. And he, he found these artifacts in this, these bottom layers of this quarry. And these layers down here, according to both Routot and modern geologists, are about 30 million years old. Now, the objects are still in the collection of the Royal Museum of Natural Sciences in Brussels. 
If you go to that museum, you won't see them. Now, if you'd gone there in the year 1920, you would have seen them uh, on display in the main hall of the museum with ages of 30 million years attached to them. But you know, after Rutot died, his colleagues thought, we can't have this. This is impossible. Humans didn't exist 30 million years ago. So they uh, took the collection off the display shelves, and they locked them away in the... Uh, in uh, the storage rooms of the Department of Archaeology. Now, I went there uh, about a year and a half ago, and I did get you know, permission from the director of the museum to see and photograph these artifacts for a report I gave that a, at, a, at a major international conference on archaeology that was held in Europe. Um, <clears throat> they're still there. Uh, if you go there, you won't see them, however. <clears throat> Now, a case from our own state of California, it's always fascinated me, the California gold mine discoveries. Uh, of course, we all know uh, about the California gold rush, and the miners came from around the world to get the gold there. Uh, to get it, they dug tunnels into the sides of mountains. Uh, this is Table Mountain in Tuolumne County. Um, deep inside the tunnels, the miners found human skeletons and hundreds of human artifacts in the solid rock. Uh, for example, they found many dozens of these mortars and pestles. What makes these discoveries interesting is they're found in layers of solid rock that belong to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which means these objects would be about 50 million years old. Now, you know, a Vedic archaeologist wouldn't be surprised by this, but you know, the average archaeologist today would find it quite impossible because 50 million years ago is before the time of the first apes and monkeys, uh, according to their picture of the history of life on this planet, which may be in need of re revision. Now these discoveries were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. He wrote a massive book about them that was published by Harvard University in the year 1880. But we don't hear very much about these discoveries today because of this <coughs> process of knowledge filtration. And this is the scientist most responsible for the knowledge filtering process in this particular case. This is Dr. William B. Holmes of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And what he said is this. He said, if, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, then he would not have announced those discoveries despite the imposing array of facts with which he was confronted. In other words, if the facts did not go along with the theory, then the facts had to be put aside. And that's exactly what happened. And <clears throat> Sandra asked me to say a few words about, uh, about uh, some of the reactions that came when we started trying to get these facts out to the public. Uh, as Sandra mentioned, a, a, a few years ago I was a consultant for uh, an NBC television special called The Mysterious Origins of Man, hosted by Charlton Heston. And the book was largely based on the material from, I mean, the, the television program was largely based on material from my book, Forbidden Archaeology. And during the filming, you know, we tried to get permission to see the artifacts, which are in the collection of the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. We were refused permission at that time. And Nevertheless, we did go on with the program, but it was interesting to see you know, what happened. When, um, when scientists learned that this program was going to be shown on NBC, they tried to get uh, the General Electric Company, which owns NBC, to stop NBC from showing the program. They weren't successful. The program uh, was shown several times. Um, and then, it was interesting what happened. Uh, the scientists uh, attempted to get the United States government to punish NBC 
for showing the program. And this is a le letter from uh, one of them to the FCC asking the FCC to investigate and censure NBC for having shown this program to the American people. And this wasn't just one isolated letter that one you know, scientist sent in. This was an organized campaign run from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, scientists all over America and all over the world were invited to send uh, letters of support to the FCC. Uh, in support of this. And what they wanted the FCC to do was to uh, force NBC to make primetime apologies for having shown the program. And also they wanted NBC to be fined millions of dollars so that they would never do anything like this again. Now, <clears throat> I'm happy to say that you know the FCC didn't do that, but uh, it, it may be a fact that uh, this, uh, because of attempts like this, uh, the networks may have been a little bit intimidated. Uh, so we'll, we'll see you know, what they'll do in the future uh, regarding getting more of this information out to the public. Uh, now it's interesting, recently I reapproached the officials at uh, the Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and this time I, I went to them because I'm presenting a, I wanted to present a paper on these discoveries at the next World Archaeological Congress, which was is being held in Washington D.C. in June, and actually I'm one of the co-organizers of a section on history of archaeology for that conference, which is one of the major international gatherings of you know, professional archaeologists. So, on the strength of that, uh, they did allow me to. Uh, and go into the storerooms of the museum and photograph and study uh, the artifacts, finally. Uh, and this is uh, a picture of me in the museum there, storerooms. And these are some of those very same uh, 50 million year old artifacts from the California gold mines, which are not displayed to the public, but you know, with some persistence, I was able to uh, get in there and see them. And then also from some of the old uh, maps and documents, I decided I want to try to relocate some of the gold mines uh, that these objects came from. So <clears throat> uh, this is Table Mountain uh, in Tuolumne County as it exists today. You know, I showed you the diagram there. So trying to find these gold mines was like looking for needles in haystacks. But uh, somehow or other with my team of assistants, this is uh, on the left there, Lori, who's back there at the table. And another one of my assistants is uh, a graduate student in, in archaeology. Using the old maps and documents, we actually were able to find now, I can't tell you exactly where this is, <laughs> but uh, we were able to locate some of the old mining tunnels <clears throat> uh, where these objects were found. And it's going to be the subject of some, some further, further research. Now, <clears throat> I mean, how far back in time does this evidence really go? This, uh, this is a... Um, well, one thing I'd like to point out is all the discoveries I've mentioned to you up to this point are discoveries that were made by professional scientists and reported in the professional scientific literature. You know, it, it's not just that scientists see these things or find these things. Ordinary people also uh, make discoveries. And their reports, although you might not find them in the pages of you know, the scientific literature, they might make their way into other literature, such as ordinary newspapers. Uh, so this is a, a report from the Morrisonville Times from Morrisonville, Illinois, the year 1892. It tells of a, a gold chain that was found solidly embedded um, in a piece of coal. You know, this piece of coal w was uh, being put by a woman named Mrs. Culp into a coal-burning stove. The, the piece of coal was very big, it broke in half, and inside, you know, she found the gold chain. Now from this report, we could tell what mine that the coal came from, and we got in touch with geologists uh, from the state of Illinois, and they told us that the coal from this mine is 300 million years old. 
Now going back to the scientific literature, in the year 1862, uh, a scientific journal called The Geologist published a report that a complete anatomically modern human skeleton was found uh, about 90 feet below the surface of the ground in Macoupin County, uh, Illinois. And directly above the skeleton was a thick layer of slate rock that extended for dozens of yards in all directions, completely sealing the skeleton off from the surface. And geologists told us that the layers here where the skeleton was found uh, were again about 300 million years old, you know, the same age as the gold chain found in the same state. This interesting report from Scientific American tells of a, of a beautiful metallic vase that was found solidly embedded in rock that is about 600 million years old. And finally, uh, the oldest objects that I encountered in the research that I did were round metallic spheres that have been found over the past 30 years or so by miners in South Africa. Uh, they come from a mine um, near a place called Otosdalen in the western Transvaal region. The objects, they're not huge like this. They're one or two inches in diameter. They are made uh, at least the one that was analyzed by metallurgists uh, uh, before uh, we filmed the mysterious Origins of Man television show, uh, turned out to be made of a naturally occurring iron ore called hematite. Uh, hematite is used by uh, different tribal peoples in Africa even today as a semi-precious stone. They make jewelry and other types of objects out of it. Uh, What's interesting about these objects are the parallel grooves that go around the equator of each object. This one has three parallel grooves, exactly parallel. Uh, some of them have four, some have three, some have two. Uh, <clears throat> I gave one of these objects to researchers from uh, uh, New England MUFON, New Hampshire MUFON. Uh, they had some engineers there who were interested. And uh, they sliced one in half and he, the, the engineer who was studying them measured uh, the, uh, from the center out to the edge, you know, the radius. He said it, the radius, he said, varied uh, only by one four thousandth of an inch, you know, all the way around. So he, he considered it to be very finely machined, uh, a very finely machined object to a tolerance that's very, you know, difficult even for, you know, manufacturers today to reach. Um, <clears throat> But what's interesting about these objects is they're found solidly embedded in mineral deposits over two billion years old. Uh, and the metallurgists who did examine them say they could see no way in which they could have formed naturally in the layers of the earth and therefore they had to have been manufactured by someone with human-like intelligence. So, <clears throat> so generally, as I said, we're told that you know, all the physical evidence supports this idea that humans of our type came into existence only about 100,000 years ago. But I think that's not true. Uh, I mean, I've only given you a tiny sample you know, of, the, of, the, of the evidence for extreme human antiquity that's there, that's documented in, in forbidden archaeology. But you know, I can assure you that there are massive amounts of evidence showing that humans of our type have been uh, present throughout this entire period of time. And you know, I think if we want to uh, theorize about uh, how uh, extraterrestrial interventions may have influenced the presence and development of the human species on this planet, we have to take this evidence uh, you know, into, into account. Tonight we'll examine these and other controversial findings to see if what we're being taught about the origins of man is supported by the evidence. Over the past two centuries, archaeologists have collected bones and artifacts that suggest there's a logical sequence of evolutionary steps from ape to man. Man's earliest relatives were ape-like beings who appeared around 25 million years ago. The first of those to walk upright emerged 20 million years later. Over the remaining 5 million years, he continued to evolve. 
passing through various stages of development until modern man, like ourselves, emerged over 100,000 years ago. Archaeologists determine the age of artifacts by the level of strata or layer of earth they're found in. Recent artifacts associated with modern man are generally found close to the surface, while older, more primitive artifacts are in deeper layers of the ground. But sometimes artifacts are found that break all the rules. Archaeologists call them anomalous artifacts. What happens when we find a modern human skull in rock strata far beneath even the oldest of man's ancestors? In their controversial book, Forbidden Archaeology, Michael Cremo and Dr. Richard Thompson have documented hundreds of these anomalous artifacts which have yet to be explained. The basic body of evidence that we've uncovered in this book suggests that uh, human beings of modern anatomical type have been existing for many, many millions of years into the past. In 1880, California state geologist J.D. Whitney was intrigued by an unexpected discovery made 300 feet under Table Mountain. While digging for gold, miners unearthed a variety of stone tools such as mortar and pestles and ladles. Incredibly, the rock strata the tools were reportedly found in was dated as early as 55 million years old. Whitney made a thorough report in these finds and came to an unsettling conclusion. Man could be millions of years older than the current evolutionary model suggests. This bizarre evidence seems to have been well documented, yet the general public and many within the scientific community are unaware of these controversial finds. The question is, why haven't we heard of these discoveries before? Oh, I think we're talking about a massive cover-up. Uh, as I said, over the past 150 years, uh, these archaeologists and anthropologists have covered up as much evidence as they've dug up, literally. Basically, what you find is uh, something we call a knowledge filter. This is a fundamental feature of science. It's also a fundamental feature of human nature. People tend to filter out things that don't fit that don't make sense in terms of their paradigm or their way of thinking. So in science you find that evidence that doesn't fit the accepted paradigm tends to be eliminated. It's not taught, it's not discussed, and people who are educated in, in scientific teachings generally don't even learn about it. According to geologist Virginia Steen McIntyre, she was silenced at the height of her career because of her determination to report the facts. In the summer of 1966, a collection of stone tools, including this leaf-shaped spear point, was uncovered at Hoyatlico, Mexico. To find out exactly how old the spear points were, a team of experts from the United States Geological Survey was called in to date them. When we first began to work on the Hoyatlico site, we thought we had an old site. This was back in 66, and we thought it was perhaps 20,000 years old. And at that time, that was considered a very old age for the site. We did what they call radiometric dates, which gives an actual date range. And we used two different methods to do that. One was using uranium uh, atoms, another one was using little zircon crystals. When we finally got the dates and all the different methods we used to date it, it came out to be 250,000 years old. To tell you the truth, I would have been happy with a 20,000-year-old date. It would have made my career. It was very old for the time, but it wasn't so old that it was that controversial. People can take 20,000 year steps. They can't take steps that are over 200,000 years at one time. And I was rather naive. I thought, okay, we've got something big here, but I'm just going to stick with the date. We've got the information. We've got the facts. Let's get the facts out and go on from there. And I didn't realize it was going to ruin my whole career. According to Dr. McIntyre, because she stuck to the facts, all of her professional opportunities were closed off. She's not worked in her chosen field since. The site was closed and permission for further investigation was denied forever. It's not necessarily a deliberate conspiracy in the sense of some people getting together in a smoke-filled room and saying, we're going to de uh, deceive people. It's something that happens automatically within the scientific community. So when a given piece of evidence disagrees with the predominant theory, then automatically 
People won't talk about it, they won't report it, and that means that science fails to progress in the way that one would hope. Dinosaurs left their tracks on this riverbank 100 million years ago. Did humans walk here at the same time? Next, a man who claims these prints are proof that humans lived with the dinosaurs. Ever since dinosaurs were first discovered in the 18th century, they've fascinated people of all ages. The Tyrannosaurus rex stood over 30 feet in height. He's considered the most ferocious predator ever to walk the earth. A brontosaurus grew to the length of three city buses. He weighed more than 90 tons. The reign of the dinosaur ended, according to one theory, when a giant meteor crashed into the earth with the force of thousands of hydrogen bombs. A cloud of dust was raised, which blocked the sun for years. This marked the end of the dinosaurs. According to conventional scientific theory, no human beings were alive then to witness these events. Or were they? Over a hundred million years ago, the limestone bedrock of the Paluxy River in Texas was a muddy plain. It was here that countless dinosaurs left their footprints to be fossilized and preserved forever. But the tracks of another creature have also been preserved in these banks, possibly the tracks of man. Archaeologist Carl Bau has led the investigation of these controversial prints for over 12 years. My reaction was one of shock. I had heard of human footprints being found in this locale uh, on the Paluxy near Glen Rose, Texas, but I was rather skeptical. And uh, here, after removing actual rock layers, the team and I excavated a series of dinosaur footprints. And 18 and one half inches from one of those dinosaur footprints, we excavated a 16 inch human footprint. We excavated 12 footprints in a series and when you find a trail with left right left right pace and stride the right distance apart then you have to interpret this as belonging to uh, humankind it's been claimed that the Paluxy River footprints are a hoax carved into the limestone bedrock as a tourist attraction well we found trails leading under limestone ledges and actually remove the limestone ledges one slab of rock at a time. And we found that both the dinosaur footprints and the trail of human footprints continued under the rock ledges. This evidence is real. Today, many of the so-called human prints have fallen victim to erosion and the hands of vandals. Carl Bau is in possession of one of the most compelling prints ever found. What you were about to see is the most controversial artifact in his collection. I first saw the Burdick print on my initial visit to Glen Rose in 1984. My impression at that time was that it was too perfect. But it's clearly a human footprint demonstrating the heel section, the arch, the base of the metatarsals, the first or great toe, second, third, fourth, and fifth toe. After our examination of this print, we find that it definitely is in the Cretaceous uh, limestone, in the same formation with the dinosaur footprints. Here we're looking at a cross section, and we can see very obvious following contours under the great toe, and actually structures under each one, where we see the calcite inclusion, the force was concentrated and produced these load-bearing structures, which are exactly what geologists look for. We have eliminated uh, the idea that it's carved. It definitely is original impression in the sediment. This is said to be the fossilized finger of a human being. It too was reportedly found in the same strata as the dinosaur tracks, dating to over a hundred million years old. It had what appeared to be a nail, what appeared to be a cuticle, a taper, a humanoid shape. After I saw the CAT scan, there was no longer any room in my mind for doubt. This scan shows the shape of the finger. It shows tissue beneath the skin of the finger. It shows the bone. It shows the joints. It shows a ligament. That tells me this is a human finger.
The limestone layer that preserved these artifacts is reportedly dated at around 135 million years old. Yet, as we saw earlier, objects have been found in rock strata much older than this. In Klerkstorp, South Africa, hundreds of metallic spheres were found by miners in Precambrian strata, said to be a fantastic 2.8 billion years old. The controversy centers around the fine grooves encircling some of the spheres. Lab technicians were at a loss to explain how they could have been formed by any known natural process. According to the curator of the Klerksdorp Museum, Rolf Mars, these spheres are a complete mystery. They look man-made, yet at the time in Earth's history when they came to rest on this rock, no intelligent life existed. They're like nothing I've ever seen before. Author researcher David Hatcher Childress has written numerous articles on the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs. I think that one of the solutions to the paradox of dinosaurs and people together and the vast discrepancy in time, this, the whole timeline of, of millions of years versus only thousands of years, can be explained in a cataclysmically geological view of the past, where rather than geological events taking place over millions of years, they take place more quickly. And what is a million years on a geological time scale is in fact only, say, a thousand years. And therefore, it's going to bring all this dating much closer to us and make it possible so that, in a scientific way, man and dinosaurs can have existed together in the past. And in fact, dinosaurs can still be alive today in small numbers in remote areas of the world. For instance, in 1977, a Japanese fishing boat off New Zealand brought up out of the water the carcass of what appeared to be a pleliosaur an animal that should have been extinct for millions of years. Although the authenticity of this photograph has never been disproved, skeptics have claimed it's merely the body of a decomposing shark. We've seen a broad range of evidence, some of it highly speculative, but there are enough well-documented cases to call for a closer look at the conventional explanation of man's origins, the theory of evolution. England is the birthplace of evolution's first champion, Charles Darwin. Darwin's theory of evolution proposes that simple life forms or species evolve into more complex species by accidental changes over long periods of time. For example, given five million years, an ape can evolve into a man. Since Darwin's time, his theory has become central to our understanding of how man came into existence. It's almost universally accepted today. But according to science investigator Richard Milton, Darwin's theory of how man evolved from the apes has some critical problems. The building behind me is London's Natural History Museum. It looks rather like a cathedral or a church, and in a way that's what it is. It's a kind of temple to Darwin's theory of evolution. People come to museums like the Natural History Museum to get answers to their question. Have we evolved from apes? Do humans and apes share a common ancestor? And to look at an exhibit like this, you'd think that question had been answered decisively yes. But the answer is far from decisive. In fact, this representation is an interpretation of the fossils, the interpretation of one group of scientists. There are other interpretations, but you won't find them in this museum or any other museum in the world. Darwinists have promised us a missing link, and so they've got to deliver. They've got to come up with one. Uh, any missing link will do, it seems. Every so often a skeleton is found in Africa, its uh, discoverers describe it as being the missing link, the headlines come and go, and then later on, that skeleton, th those bones are reclassified either as human or as ape. And so far, the missing link is still missing. One of the most classic examples of this is the story of Java Man, discovered by Eugene Dubois in 1892. Dubois discovered a very primitive looking ape-like skull cap and he discovered this thigh bone about 40 feet away. He said, well obviously they must belong to the same creature. And that creature walked erect like a, a human being and had an ape-like skull, so that must be a missing link. The Pithecanthropus ape man. So maybe you had a big ape and a, a human being living together in Java about a million years ago. The important point to make about the Java Man discovery 
is that it's based on a speculative leap in which two pieces of evidence are put together in a way that's not really warranted. At the end of his life, Dubois realized that the skull cap belonged to a large ape and the leg bone was from a man. Nevertheless, Java Man was prominently displayed at the Museum of Natural History in New York until 1984. Since then, it has been removed. Today, museums all over the world display models of yet another skeleton they call the missing link, the common ancestor of both man and ape. Lucy, you know, the famous australopithecine uh, discovered by Donald Johansson. He says she was very human-like, but I was at a conference of anthropologists where many of them were making a case that she was hardly distinguishable from an ape or a monkey. These bones have been restored to resemble a missing link, part human, part ape, and Lucy is now thought of as being our long lost ancestor. But this is merely an interpretation, the interpretation of one group. Those same bones can be, and they have been taken by scientists, and identified as simply an extinct ape, nothing to do with us at all. Newspapers are constantly reporting new discoveries that add to our understanding of man's origins, but so far, conclusive evidence of a missing link has not been found. So what happens to the evolutionary model if the missing link does not exist at all? Without it, there's little support for man's connection with the apes, and the model simply collapses. Some people have said to me, how can you criticize a theory if you can't, if you don't have something to replace it with? Well, I don't accept that. If the emperor hasn't got any clothes on, then the emperor hasn't got any clothes on. It's not my fault. It seems to me that if Darwinism is wrong, then somebody has got to point the finger. To argue against this, let me join you, because this uh, march of progress type thing for human evolution is not what we see in the fossil record. Uh, it was something that was dreamed up 150 years ago, but it, we have much more like a, a bush. It's not a straight ladder-like progression. So again, the difference between us and the other apes is great, but we didn't evolve from them.